Got another episode of Point Four Podcast. Myself, Andre Gadala, and Mr. Ohio Evan Turner, aka Mr. Westside of Chicago. And uh, we got a special guest today. Um, somebody we've been growing a, a great relationship, not just personally, but uh, from a business aspect. Uh, the great John Skipper. And uh, I'm excited about this one because uh, I just want to dive into kind of his journey into where he is right now and kind of how he's. Uh, navigated in different spaces, starting his own platforms to, you know, running a streaming service platform early on with the zone and, you know, uh, being with ESPN, that's a heavy lift. So um, welcome to the show, sir. Appreciate you giving us the time and be ready to dig in. Thank you. I'm um, happy to be here, Andre. Happy to be here, Evan. Look forward to a good, uh, lively discussion. No doubt. So I uh, kind of kick things off. Um, Metal Arc, can you can you kind of give us uh, what is Metal Arc and, and what does it do? Well, what a Metal Arc does that no almost no other bird can do is it can sing and fly at the same time. And uh, I wanted to start a content company, and I wanted to think about what it ought to be called. And uh, I thought we want to sing, which means we want to make great content, and we want to fly, which means we want to make some money. And uh, <laughs> It also has a nice little underlying meaning, uh, very important to my generation, but, but you guys are familiar with the great metal art lemon. Uh, and I used to love uh, going to see the Harlem Globetrotters when I was a kid and they would come around. It was metal art and Curly Neal. So I just thought a little bit of sports underlying meaning, uh, you know, a lovely bird that can fly and sing. I uh, just thought it was a nice, name for a company to make great content. And I thought there's no moment, been no moment in time where content, great storytelling is more in demand than it is now, because you have all these streaming companies, Amazon, Apple, um, that want content. You got the traditional uh, Showtime, HBO, they need content. Also other companies, DraftKings, who we're in business with, they want content. It's a great demand for content. It's what I love to do the best. Uh, so uh, that's why I started this company. It's been a good, good journey. And I'm happy uh, right now to be traveling at least on part of that road with uh, the two of you because athletes are an important part of this conversation now. And uh, uh, you guys are bright minds and good ideas and, and aggressive and energetic. And uh, again, I, I would echo your words, Andre. I, Hope we're creating something that's very fulfilling to you and to me, both personally and professionally, and uh, with our friend Mr. Turner as well. Yeah, perfect. Uh, that kind, that, 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 oh. Go ahead, Evan. Oh, go, Dre. You got it. I'm listening. No, so that kind of goes into you know uh, what I want to kind of ask Evan. You know, here at Point Four, you know we, you know we kind of come up with our lane. You know where we're sports and culture intersect. And with culture, we mean things that move, uh, that are moved by the community that we come from. Obviously, African Americans are the, um, the highest per capita uh, consumer spenders. You know, so we identify what's cool. Everyone adapts to it. We make the music. You know, what I'm saying we make the vibes. We we do all these things, and um, so tech falls in that. You know, uh, the consumer spending falls into that. Art falls into that. You know, uh, obviously the sports part of that comes into it. You know, kind of how we think. The, the great conversations we had with um, Isaiah Thomas. You know, thinking in 0. 0.6 seconds, we move in tenths of a second, and uh, we're not just building a podcast. We're looking to build. Uh, more than that with content and that kind of goes into uh, Evan wanting to kind of hear you know what your thoughts were when you first met Skipper and kind of what your idea your vision was of kind of wanting what you wanted to be to build and then after that I want Skipper you know if you can kind of give me your take on how your first interaction and meeting was with us too okay yeah. yeah I think one thing my first interaction obviously when I first heard about Metal Lark Clearly, you know, John's uh, reputation precedes itself. So I knew we were kind of, you know, going with the right group, the right guy, somebody that has a recipe and formula. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I was excited for that. I, I loved everything he had done prior to the 30 for 30s and, 
and things along those lines. I just wanted to sit down and hear what he had in store for us and, you know, what, what he saw for us and, and what position and, and he could put us in and, you know, how could we help each other? That was the number one thing because you see all these great things he had built. And I was like, okay, what, what's next? It was super intriguing. Yeah. Uh, let, let me first tell everybody who's listening an important thing which is we're equal owners in this, yeah. right? This is not right. a relationship where, you know, one party is the owner and one party is the talent. Right. We're equal owners. So to people who are listening to this, understand that Andre and Evan own half of this company, not Metal Arc, but uh, New Amendment, which yeah. is their company, which Metal Arc is helping to found. So I like the idea. I think it's important athletes have, it, it, we had a, a, a really interesting thing happen yesterday that Tom Brady announced on Twitter that he was going to return. Did anybody criticize that move or say that he shouldn't have announced that? No. Where did that start? That started with LeBron James and athlete empowerment. LeBron made the decision that he was going to control his announcement. Uh, he was going to make it on ESPN. We were criticized. He was criticized for that. No criticism yesterday of Tom Brady. That's how a, a thing that LeBron started, athlete empowerment. We have the right to tell of our own stories. We have the right to control our own narrative. And what I hope we're doing together is I have some expertise in media and creation of documentaries and doing things. You guys have genuine stories. You're younger than I am, so you're more in touch with technology. Remember the first meeting in the apartment? First of all, the main thing was we had a great time. If you remember, yeah. we laughed, we talked about music. Yeah. You yeah. told me why Tyler Hansborough was overrated. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we laughed about that. I'm a Carolina guy. First thing Evan tells me is Tyler Hansborough is overrated. Uh, we had a good time. If you can't have, look, we're working on something together. If you can have a good time, what's the point of doing it? Right? Yeah. Everybody here is smiling. Absolutely. We're smiling. I'm happy to see you. I hope these days you're happy to see me. We already got some more things cooking. And uh, yeah. we got a successful debut. You guys did a beautiful job with Isaiah, Steph Curry. Uh, not many people get off to this good, the kind of start you guys got off to this. So congratulations. I'm thrilled so far. I hope you are. But it was chemistry, wasn't it really, uh, Andre? I mean, it was chemistry. We sat, you guys sat on one sofa. I sat on another sofa. We laughed. Uh, your, your, uh, your friend Patience was there. I had a couple of people working for me there. and. We got along. We got along. We got we got a, a way we all see this working and, and we're off to a good start. So that's that's what I think about all this. So, so that leads me to my next question. You know, how do you define good talent? Like what does that look like to you that you want to go into business with? You know, I think among the most important things is intellectual curiosity, right? It's mm -hmm. people who care about learning about things, are flexible minded and open willing to work with other people and look the first from the first meeting i could see the level of intellectual curiosity you guys have had some experiences i haven't right um mm -hmm. i'm a 66 year old white man from north carolina uh, we got i heard you call uh evan a west side west side of chicago guy you're an ohio uh, ohio guy we uh we had different experiences different generation and when you get a mix together of complementary experiences and skills but you like each other and you have enthusiasm, that's how you can make a business. And I'm highly confident the three of us with help from uh, some other people are gonna make a big, a good business. I got a question for you, John. Is that somewhat what intrigued you? Most people don't know, but in 2018, you got the champion award, uh, you know, given by the women in sports and events. Does that intrigue, intrigue you in hiring? Like, uh, you know, the, the in the intellectual part and, you know, crossing over and kind of going outside the box and getting different type of talent and people to work with. Because when you're at ESPN, you open up the door to hire a lot of minorities, hire a lot of, you know, different people in the field that, you know, most most platforms and sports sites haven't done ever since then. Yeah. Look, look I like to work with people who are different than me, different yeah. age, came from somewhere different in the country. I'm comfortable with people. And I don't want to just work with people who look like me or who have the same experience as me. You get more, more excitement. You get more intellectual stimulation when people come from a different place and figure out how to come together and do something. It's not hard for me 
to find people who look like me at the same age, who mm. kind of want to do the same thing. I want to do some different things. I want to continue to be stimulated and interested. But again, it was the it was the personality, it was the natural affability, it was, but it was the intellectual curiosity, the experiences. And look, you can't, I tell people if you got to choose between brains and experience, choose brains, because you can't get any more brains. You can get more experience. Yeah. So I saw a couple of young men with brains and with intellectual curiosity that I thought I would enjoy working with. It's about as simple as that. Thanks, real appreciate that. So walk us back to, you know, I think that figure as CEO of ESPN, you know, when you're a young basketball player like myself or Evan was, you know, we don't really understand the the oomph that comes behind being a CEO in general, because there's CEOs of everything. You know, there's there's so many different startups, mm -hmm. there's so many different companies, different levels. But, you know, in our world and once we both got more in tune with uh, the CBA or the BRI or how the, uh, where our salary comes from. The majority of our salary comes from the TV contracts. Mm -hmm. And now our, our, our interest is starting to become peaked and okay, who are the people we need to know? How does this machine work? Mm -hmm. And the CEO of ESPN is a very important figure to our game. Mm -hmm. That's a very powerful position to be in. Can you walk us back and kind of Give us your journey on how you got to that particular point and then kind of how you knew like, oh, I'm I'm that guy as well. Like this is, you know, I've arrived and, and this is where I plan on going with this thing. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I never as a kid grew up thinking I want to run a company. I want to be a business person. I want to be a writer. I want to be an editor. I cared about books. I cared about music. I went to work for Rolling Stone in 1979, spent 10 years doing that, spent a year at Spin. Went to the Walt Disney Company to start books and magazines. And the most fortuitous event in my life is when ABC Cap Cities was sold to Disney. ABC Cap Cities owned ESPN and they asked me to start a magazine. I don't know if you remember ESPN Magazine. We started in yes, 1998. Sir. Yes, on the sir. Cover, by the way, on the cover were four athletes, one baseball player, one football player, one basketball player, and one hockey player. It was backwards, Eric Lindros slash Stewart, uh, A-Rod, and Kobe Bryant. Kobe. And on the cover, it said next. We got next. Mm -hmm. They were, we thought, going to be the next four players in the four sports. We thought we were going to be the next magazine. Wow. Sports Illustrated was the magazine then. So that worked. And when you're in business, you have to own something. And I don't mean mm -hmm. necessarily equity. I mean, you got to get credit for something. I was lucky that the magazine worked. I wasn't responsible for the success of that. Everybody was, the whole team. But I got credit because all credit rises to the top, right? You win a championship, who gets to accept the trophy? The damn owner. I didn't <laughs> see the owner scoring points, but he gets to accept the trophy. Well, that's what I get to do. I got to accept the trophy. I went and ran ESPN Digital, ESPN Ad Sales, then was the editor-in-chief. I never expected any of this. You, the, the two of you had a dream, right? From a pretty early age, I'm assuming. Uh, yes. Tell me about that. I'm assuming, and I've read The Sixth Man, of course, Andre. I didn't have a dream when I was 12 or 13 to be the CEO of ESPN. But, but tell me, you had that dream, right? You, you got to fulfill your dream. I'm assuming when? 12, 13, 14? You knew you were going to, you wanted to be in the NBA. I would say... You know, Evan, you can you can answer too, but I I started watching basketball was a Fab Five, and that's when I knew I wanted to go to Michigan and play basketball. So I wasn't even thinking about the NBA, but you know, I started watching MJ in the finals around the same time. It was just like, all right, Michigan first, and then play for the Chicago Bulls after that. You know, not knowing how what it took, but it was just like that picture was painted, you know, vividly with my you know with my imagination and my dreams. Mm -hmm. The Mine was similar. Um, I grew up in Chicago, so obviously, uh, you know, MJ, he brought a lot of hoopla and hysteria. And, you know, much like North Carolina, Chicago is a basketball area. So I think when I was five or six or whatever, I, I, it was a dream that I for sure wanted to partake in. And, and it was a dream that was realized. So I was definitely blessed for that. I mean, it's interesting, right? You take different journeys to 
ending up in something that is a dream. It's a dream to be the CEO of ESPN. Lots of people come out of college and I always had people, if I go to business schools, they say, tell me how you got to be the CEO of ESPN. You, you can't dream when you're 12 to be the CEO of ESPN. Yeah. You can dream right. to be in the NBA, but not many people have that happen. I'm going to give you a little trouble. You guys gave me a lot of trouble about Tyler Hansborough. Now you're <laughs> telling me that MJ, you know MJ's a Carolina guy. Yeah, for sure. He's the oh, best sure. of all time. Okay. And, <laughs> yeah. and by the way, you knew who kept the Fab Five from winning their first championship. Yes, Carolina. Eric Montross. Eric yes, Montross, exactly. George Carolina. Lynch. Yeah. Eric yeah. Montross, George Lynch. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I do remember yeah. that. I do by remember the way, that. and that is that was a game when college basketball had seven, eight players on the two teams that played for the championship that were killer players. Yeah. You didn't, I mean, now you don't have any teams that have that kind of talent. When North Carolina played Georgetown, when Indiana played, mm -hmm. you know, the Indiana Bobby Knight teams, the Kentucky teams, they had seniors, juniors, sophomores, and freshmen. It's very different now. Yeah. Well, it's, it's almost different. like, it's almost like NCAA has been disrupted by, I'll use a parallel, it's just, just like the streaming wars. It's like you got all these new entities trying to figure out a way to uh, monetize the, the 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 amateur athlete because the amateur athlete has been I'm looking for the right word to use has been you know taking advantage of you know that's probably the politically Side correct way to say it yes <laughs> right yeah. look, look, like, 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 if if I had to work as hard in college as you had to work. I didn't work hard in college. You guys worked really hard in college and your college got a lot more benefit. Arizona, Ohio State got a lot more benefit from you than North Carolina got from me. <laughs> I would have made them pay me. If I'm gonna work was, this hard, so it's right. Correct, so what's interesting to me is, the, the, but you say the game was at its best when athletes were getting paid. It was like, you know, we're just paying our dues to get to the professional ranks. And now it's been like, all right, we're trying to identify the correct model. It's almost like streaming. You know, you see the streaming valuations go up and down. You know, like we talked about it before. We got, you know, from uh, Netflix kind of came in and changed the game. And then you saw Disney Plus, you know, mm -hmm. obviously you work for Disney, you work for Bob Iger. They had this whole streaming rollout. And then now you're ever seeing everyone follow these models. But it's like, if you're not hitting certain subscriptions numbers every quarter, your stock price is being directly hit by it. And right. that says a lot about the power of where we're going with the technology. You know, we do our, you know, guns and butter, AKA fiduciary responsibility mm -hmm. segment, where we're just talking about money and how it works. Mm -hmm. I see the same similarities in the, in the, college basketball landscape or post you know high school landscape you got the overtime league you got the g league that's doing something with the ignite uh, uh david west had a, a startup he was doing you got guys going overseas so it's kind of watered down the landscape of the ncaa and i don't know if there's as much excitement behind it anymore you know being a ceo uh, of an entity like espn uh just kind of give me your thoughts on you know, what would be the idea scenario where we can kind of get that, uh, we can get that, we can gain that feeling back, kind of like that, you know, March mm -hmm. Madness is here, you know, uh, you, you kind of get that school spirit, you know, you could get the top athletes, you're not worried about, you know, just, right, you know, going to get one and done athletes and you can kind of just, well, and everyone's still being taken care of. I thought the NIL deal was decent, but, you know, we'll talk about that after that. Well, we can talk, but we'll start there and work back. The, the NIL is not an ultimate solution, right? Correct. The, it, it really still lets the colleges off the hook. It lets mm -hmm. somebody else pay the money. The colleges will still get the benefit, right? The boosters will watch the game. They'll be happy if the team wins. They'll give more money to the schools. They'll fill up those stadiums. They'll sell concessions. And the reason that you ended up with, with, one it, which it was one and done that really changed the college game right because mm -hmm. because who wants to work hard for free when you can work hard for money and if your That's ultimate correct. goal is to get to the nba anyway it's just a way station you're just going there because you have to go for one year i think they just need to give that up and say let let men they're young men but they're young men who have advisors let those young men decide what they want to do. You want to play in the G League? You want to play in the, you're good enough to play in the NBA out of high school? You want to go to college? Do what you want to do. 
but there has to be an appropriate exchange of value, right? There was an inappropriate exchange of value. The university was getting all the credit, all the value, the, and they did not live up to their end of the bargain, right? Their end of the bargain, which worked at one point was, come, we'll give you a scholarship. You get a free college education. We'll take care of you. That's not good enough anymore. And they also broke that promise, right? You know all the players who ended up not getting the education they should have gotten. The colleges did not keep their end of the bargain because they wanted to get the value. They didn't want to exchange appropriate value in exchange for it. Now they're going to let other people provide kids the value, but ultimately got to figure out some appropriate exchange of value. And look, for the athletes at the highest level, uh, it may not be going to college, right? Nobody fusses because tennis players don't go to college, right? right. Nobody fusses that soccer players don't go to college. Maybe you get your education. You know, smart people figure out how to get their education in life by going to get their college degree online or by going to school later. Uh, I just think um, uh, you got to, and, and I love college basketball, but, but again, I mean, uh, Andre, in your book, you talk about the fact that they weren't, they weren't being fair to you, right? Uh, at, at Arizona, they were getting their value and you weren't even clear that they were telling you the truth about your value. Right. I right. hope you don't uh, mind my bringing that up. Uh, no, 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 you're, you're, no, you're hundred percent correct. And I think it's, it was more of in terms of, you know, I don't want to get Evan, I want to get your perspective on it. It was more like, you know, you're getting the education, you're getting a free education. And that's something that uh, regular students don't get. But then there was also rules where my freshman year, I couldn't get a job. And then my mother had two kids in college that can't get jobs. So how are we supposed to survive outside of the small stipend? And then she just barely made enough to where we didn't fall under that. Um, we weren't, we didn't qualify for that big grant that like Pell grant you can get. Yeah, that Pell <laughs> grant, yeah. You gotta right. use somebody so, else's, you gotta use somebody else's. <laughs> correct. So yeah. it was just like, it was just like, I was just stuck between a rock and a hard place. And it was like, why would I come back to school? Like I have an opportunity to go pro and that was, that was my biggest issue with college. It was like, you're not thinking about going pro, are you? Like, I you know I had the AD approach me a few times. We had never spoken before. And this is when I knew I, you know, I had a little bit of uh, influence and a little bit of power. It's like the AD has never spoken to me. I know he's just, you know, that, that, that principal powerful figure. And he's pulling me to the side, like, hey, I'm hearing rumblings. You might go pro. That isn't true, is it? And I'm like, oh. Oh, like it would click, you know, like certain moments in your life where things just click and you never knew yeah. who you were. And it's like, okay, I'm starting to identify who I am. Right. Yeah, I think, oh, oh go, John. No, no, Evan, I was going to just ask you, what was your experience now, there? I just think, I mean, just follow up with what Dre say. I think we all have our own little experiences outside that. But I think the one thing that's really damning or shaming is uh, not saying like the cultural, but like it's already assumed that it's okay. When you break it down as an adult, you're guy and a young kid, you know money, you know finances, you know the future. There's very few people on one hand that tell you to leave that you've done so much for. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. These people showed up to your house, they know how your mom's living, they know how your family's living, they yep. know your background, they know your test scores, they know everything. So sometimes when you break it down or whatever, it's like, why is the AD coming up to you as opposed to being like, are you staying and being like, what can we do for you? Thank you for helping this university. You know what I mean? This is what's best for you. Go out and pro provide for your family. This is the most money I've seen working over the right. past 50 years. Right. You have to go do this. Like, you know what I mean? I think that's like the crazy part mm -hmm. of being wrong because when it comes down to it, I'm sure Dre will hear it as much as anything. We would get knocked for, you know, maybe basketball being our number one option. Mm -hmm. Or saying like you can't rely on your athletic ability or like saying, hey, we don't have any money to go get a job where you go to school for free, like legitimately people graduate and be still stupid. So like that mm -hmm. education is un no, but it's the truth. The education is unbelievable. It's a great trade off. But it's like, right. no, dog, like we're bringing in a millions of dollars each month. Right. You know what I mean? I think the biggest tragedy travesty is when you're an adult and you're not pushing a kid to do what's best for him. Say, say what you want about John Calipari. But his thing is, if you want to stay for me. You're going to make my family do better. Yes. You want to take care of your family? Then leave. And I feel like that's the number one thing that you go to college for is to get a career, an opportunity, and run it up. And, and I feel like in our sport and our atmosphere, if you decide to rely on your talent, you might not always get the best advice or 
the, the best advice that should be screaming louder in a bigger picture. Right. right. And I do, I do agree with you on Calipari. He, he genuinely tells his guys, if, if you need to leave, take care of your family. Remember when he won the championship and somebody had a kind of a hostile question where they're like, how do you feel about this? Taking advantage of these kids, uh, one and done. Calipari said, are you kidding me? If you change the rule, I would love to have all these kids come back. But with the rule the way it is, it's not in their best interest, and I'm going to tell them their best interest. And now you're back to what we are talking about before. There's not an equal exchange of value. The athletic director is coming to you, and all he's worried about is, are you leaving? Well, then what value are you giving me to stay? That's what you were saying, right, right? Evan? Uh, is Absolutely. At, yeah. And the people who are the, the, the worst offense is when it happens really, and it's not with – you guys, because you were smart enough to figure out the right thing for you to do. It's ironic because both of you guys like learning. You like learning mm -hmm. things. My guess is you would have enjoyed four years of college if it was about intellectual stimulation and you felt you're getting equal exchange of value. The most heinous thing that happens is when they take kids into a school who aren't ready to be in that school. It's a full-time job. Wasn't yeah. playing basketball a full-time job at Ohio State? Absolutely. 100%. 6 a.m. And Arizona? 6 and 8. Full-time job. Full-time job. So you don't have time to take advantage of the things you'd like to do at college. You barely, you're missing a lot of class, right? Because you got to go travel to play basketball. To me, the worst part is when you got kids going to play football and they have not been adequately prepared to be in that college. And they don't get any help getting to the NFL really hard. And most of these kids aren't going to get there, right? You can identify out of, out of even high school, who are the kids are going to get to the NBA? Correct. Right? Correct. It's harder for football players and they take yes. advantage of them. And it is shameful that kids come out of four years. You got to play three years for college yeah. football. If you come out after three years and there are kids who still reading at the sixth grade level who haven't been to class and they've been protected. You're not protecting them by not making them go to class. You're making certain that they are not going to be prepared to do other things than play in the NFL. And most of them aren't. So, so it's about equal exchange of value. And while it may, I was waxing a little bit nostalgic about how great the teams were then, I don't think we go back to that. That's not fair to the people who are playing. Right. Right. Well, so my, I guess my next question I pose to all three of us, what does that, what's that landscape look like? How do we get that balance to where the athlete is, you know, still giving it, giving it their all on the court. The coach doesn't have to worry about the kid transferring, you know, every, every, every semester or every year leaving, um, you know, the kid doesn't have to rush to the professional ranks when they're not ready. Uh, but at the same time, the kid's being able to learn. The kid's being a kid. I think, you know, we're, our, our, our college athletes are missing out on being kids more than ever. One of my favorite uh, social media uh, posts this past week was the kid that just lost, right, Evan? The kid lost and he was crying. They said, what do you miss? What are you going to miss most about college? <laughs> this man had his head down tearing up like said, what you gonna miss most that man looked up and said going to dinner <laughs> going out to dinner <laughs> you know <laughs> it was the funniest thing i ever seen because he was serious he was like going out to dinner was what i'm gonna miss about college most but it, it was like a funny moment we laughed at but in actuality it's like i can identify with that like being a yeah. kid you know that bonding experience like that's something that you 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 have to go through to understand and appreciate right that you don't get anymore because everything's looked at as like a business now. So for you two, like, what is that, you know, what would that idea um, situation look like where, where all sides could, could benefit? Yeah. I, I mean, I would, to be honest with you, I enjoy every part of college um, besides like when you break down a part of like, you know, my mom be on a mega bus, you understand what I'm saying? Or like sometimes I'll just be throwing up 30, 30 or something going crazy and like my mom's taking a bus home at 10 at night yeah. so like legitimately we're human just as much as anybody else like I, I think one thing that um 
I guess it has to be a case by case thing because most kids you go to these institutions of higher learning, you know, with or whatever, their parents are somewhat taken care of. They're doing okay and stuff. But I think sometimes if there's just a little bit, maybe more money dispersed or something, maybe that would have been, you know, a, a great idea because, you know, I remember, you know, hopping in back of a, you know, old school mountaineer and it's six of us. It's like literally the shortest dude is six, three, you know? So there's certain stuff that we're, where we were grinding with and struggling with that made absolutely no sense because there was money coming around. Yeah. And I'm getting tired of like putting my hand up in a circle where I don't have a car, but like the Dobo or whoever else is getting a car or like yeah. he can't hit a shot. He can't do nothing, <laughs> but they passing out free cars, so, you know, <laughs> like to the, to the coaching staff. I think the number one thing is just making sure people are, you know, taken care of or, you know, the services rendered, whether that be like uh, what the, you know, Euros do with the soccer clubs or something right. like mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing right about, uh, you know, the, the number one and best businesses in the country and the workers are working for free. Yeah. Understand what I'm saying? When you start breaking down the history and the system and everything else like that, yeah. I mean, it sounds a lot close to, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and when you break down the sports, there's only two sports that really get regulated from what I know. Yep. Yes. Football, which makes no a running back is beat up by the time he's leaving. And then right. basketball, a baseball player could be terrible, show up to school, play baseball, go play baseball here, play yeah. football, like whoever. A tennis tennis star could be individual from day one, do absolutely whatever they want, and it's okay. Yeah. A legit, you got, like, even if you were bad, you're an 18-year-old went somewhere. That 60000 that you're bringing in for your family is way more than, you know, what you might be bringing in being a freshman on campus. But the opportunity to make the money is, that's in peril because we literally come from nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I hadn't thought about it this way before. We may be at a moment where we need to kind of separate the professionals from the amateurs, right? Mm -hmm. That's what's happened. You just mentioned tennis, Evan. People have a good experience going to play tennis in college. It's fun. They can, it's a full-time job too, or close to it, but they can yeah. still have fun. But the guys who are going to, the men and women who are going to play on the tour, they don't go to college. They, yeah. they go ahead and get on the tour and play. And maybe we need to separate the professionals from the amateurs. Cause you're right. It's only two sports. It's football and basketball. Uh, baseball you speak players. It, you speak what? about an exec as, as an exec, uh, uh, a skipper that takes out the profit that is the foundation of these schools. It's almost like the foundation of America is based on what? It's free labor. Yeah. And you talk about a lot of these, when the pandemic hit and there were no sports, no football, no basketball, these, a lot of these institutions talking about some, we not, we may not make it to next year because yeah. we're relying on this. We relying on this income from these yeah. two sports to survive and i think a lot of athletes saw how much power they had right when that the pandemic revealed a whole lot the curtains had to come back yeah and, and bro when you go to school too i mean if there's no sports and it's just school you might as well just graduate from the ride like low key, right? <laughs> <laughs> like when you break it down you might as well just go online and we'll get you a trade if and right. i can say that whatever but I, I know people love march madness and football and stuff but they do they, so could still, they could still love it what 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 Andre just said is very profound and you got to think about the social and racial implications of that. He said this country was founded on free labor and that's right. And it is the great taint on this country is that it was founded on free labor. And when you look at who is mostly playing college football and college basketball, it's overwhelmingly black Americans. And when you say that word, that phrase free labor, Andre, that is very deep. I mean, mm -hmm. and that's that just feels wrong, doesn't it? We're still taking advantage of that free labor. Now, if the kids playing uh, weren't, had no prospect of playing in the NBA and the NFL, and you just had, the uniforms still matter. People at Ohio State would still come out to the football games and the basketball games because of the uniforms. The overall talent level would go down a little bit if you separated the professionals from amateurs, but that might be okay, right? There's a lot of programs yeah. that are doing okay. Villanova, uh, by the way, I'm not making any denigration of any single player. They have players that go in the NBA, but yeah. for the most part, Gonzaga and, and Villanova and some other places have figured out, we're going to take kids for whom college basketball is more important than professional basketball. And, mm -hmm. and we're going to win games and do good things with them. 
the 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 uh, best eighteen year olds who play basketball in this country maybe should go in the G League. I, I personally think that the G League should have one, and they're headed to this. I, I think mm -hmm. that the New York Knicks, when they have a G League team, they should be the, the Knicks, and you should get to wear the Knicks uniform. And you're in the Knicks system, and you you don't have two rounds of drafts; you have five rounds, and you bring more kids in to play in the G League, and they are a New York Knicks or they are a Golden State Warrior uh, or uh, a Detroit Piston. They're just not playing for the big team and make make it easy to go back and forth. Instead of having 12, 15 players, you'd have 25 to 30 players and you can bring them back and forth and, and, and they're all New York Knicks. Some of them play on the big team and some of them play on the G League team. I just made that up, by the way. And oh, that's, that's, that's make a, things up, I get in trouble later, but we'll see. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, it's a great thought, though. I mean, that's what we're just trying to hear. That's what we're here to do. You know, just put right. some thought provoking things into the into existence because it's almost like the European soccer, yes. uh, European football uh, model. And you know, you've seen they got some of the highest valuated franchises in the in the country. You know, uh, we got a team in limbo right now, correct? Uh, with what's yeah. going on with the war and, and politics, he had to give up the team. Right. It's in limbo right now, but you know, just Going back to you with your CEO hat on, what does that deal, that TV deal look like for the NCAA? You know, you've negotiated many deals for, with different leagues. What does it look like? How do you negotiate uh, a deal with the NCAA? Or what does the ESPN you look like being at the talent level isn't as high? I, I don't think it would be a huge economic difference. Remember, you went from players playing three or four years because they couldn't leave to players leaving after one year, and the money went up. The money went up. It's still it's still Ohio State, Michigan, right? It's it's mm -hmm. still Arizona, mm -hmm. USC. It's still Duke, North Carolina. I don't think the money would go down that much, and you would eliminate this concept of free labor. You got to figure out a way to pay the players something appropriate. You got to figure out a way for the most talented kids to go ahead and fulfill their dreams. And again, you, you, you nailed an important thing there, uh, Andre, the soccer doesn't have this problem. Lionel Messi gets into the Barcelona Academy. I think I got this right when he's 14 years old. What right. does he wants to do? He wants to play for Barcelona. And there's a kid right now, there's a 16 year old Mexican American kid playing for the Seattle Sounders. Nobody's fussing that he's not yeah. going to college for a year. Uh, he's right. playing for the Seattle Sounders and he's going to play for the U.S. national team or the Mexican national team. And then he's going to go play for Real Madrid or Manchester United. These kids get to fulfill their dreams. And it is not a coincidence that these kids are mostly. Uh, not black. They're mostly brown or white. So there still is a racial component to this, right? Nobody fusses about tennis. They they fussed about Serena and Venus when they first got there. Yes, but they did. Nobody's complaining when the Eastern European women who, who dominate the game are, nobody's asking, why didn't they go to college? You know, did we, why, why do they have them playing tennis when they're 14, 15, 16 years old? There's a, you know, there's a lot of things mixed up in this, right? Free labor, some, probably some racism, probably some exploitation. Um, and, and the best thing to do is fix it is to try to figure what's fair for everybody, as you pointed out before. Well, I mean, switching, switching lanes, it's not really switching lanes. We talk about content and, you know, I've heard, I've taken a lot of different pitches a lot of different concepts and ideas behind you know how athletes can own their own content you know how they can produce their own content um going back to 30 for 30 uh you know that was your idea correct well it was a it was a it was a many people's idea you know when an right. idea is successful right. right there's about 100 people who did it so i'm one of the 100 people mm -hmm. who did 30 for 30 uh remember i said all credit rises upward i got the credit because i was in charge but a lot right. of people had that idea. Um, well, but at, so. well, for, for me, for, for me as an investor, you may not, I may not come up with the idea, but I have to back it and I have to, you got to really trust that something's going to work for you to put your name 
on something and mm -hmm. you really put your energy behind it as well. What was it about the concept or what did you see uh, that, that made you believe that this was something that was going to be special? Or did you even know it's going to be this special? We did not know it was going to be this special. We knew it was a good idea. And by the way, I will give a few names. Bill Simmons had been in my ear about HBO for a long time. How come HBO gets to own the documentary space? Why don't we do some documentaries? Uh, and we had a 30th anniversary coming up. And so we decided in a meeting, and it's about 15 or 20 people there. And I remember it was during the Tribeca Film Festival in a suite in the Ritz Carlton at Battery Park. And we said, we're gonna do 30 films for 30 years. And they're gonna be gifts to our, our uh, viewers. And we're not gonna do a chronological, here's what happened in the last 30 years. We're gonna do 30 films. We're gonna hire great directors. And it's gonna be a mosaic of what happened over the last 30 years. So it just, it's one of those things, sometimes you don't know when you have a great idea and it just worked out. Um, but it was about storytelling and great directors. That's the thing we did right. Which one was your favorite out of 30 for 30? Which doc? Um, I have four or five favorites. It's like having yeah. kids. It's kind of tough to pick your favorite kids. But look, the most renowned film we did was OJ, Made in America. Mm -hmm. And mm. and uh, and I am very proud of that film. Uh, a young director named Ezra Edelman um, made that film. And he really is the one who gets the most credit for that. It was seven hours and 43 minutes long. We didn't start out to make a seven hour and 43 minute long film. We set out to make a two hour film. Uh, so we were agreeable, won the Oscar. And that is my favorite kind of sports story to tell. It's a story that's not about our running back from Southern Cal and Buffalo Bills. It's about race in America and what OJ meant. How could you use OJ to think about what journey we're on as a country and what happened and so that's a good one. I also like, I don't know, and this is a basketball one. Have you guys seen Once Brothers? Yeah, with uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vladi Divac and uh, yeah, Jason Petrovich, right? right. Yep. And, and look, very pertinent to what's going on today, right? With what's happening in the Ukraine. Vladi mm -hmm. and Dragon played on a very good Yugoslavian basketball team. One of the few mm -hmm. teams in the world that could compete with the United States. And, and of course, when Yugoslavia broke up after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, the, and, uh, the Soviet Empire fell. They, uh, they were on opposite sides. Suddenly, Vladi, who was Serbian, and Dragon, who was Croatian, their countries were at war. And um, yeah. they, that's why it's called Once Brothers. They were brothers. They played together and war and, and ethnic cleansing, terrible things took them apart. And to me, the heart, emotional heart of that film was when we took Vladi back to Dragon's family and back into the cemetery to see where his once brother was laying because he died in a car accident in New Jersey. Yeah. And he regretted mm -hmm. that he'd let other things get in between their friendship. So those to me are the most fun ones. The two Escobars, I don't know if you've seen that, but it's about narco yeah. trafficking yeah, yeah, and how Colombia became maybe the best soccer team in the world because of Pablo Escobar and then another uh, Colombian whose name happens to be Escobar, Andres Escobar, who's the goalkeeper, gets murdered in a yeah, parking yes. lot of a, of a nightclub. I don't, we don't know it's a direct connection, but he led in a goal in the 1994 World Cup and everybody was mad at him. So yeah. those are my favorites. The ones where you're telling something that is profound that gets you, lets you explore something really important and which sports fans should love, but non-sports fans can can be excited as well. Evan, you what's your favorite? favorite? I mean, Evan, you got a favorite? Uh, probably when in time, Reggie Miller. Oh yeah. And then obviously, like you said, prior to, uh, you know, the OJ Simpson one, because I, I thought, you know, what was cool was not doing an hour segment or one segment it was telling the whole race climate and everything in America as to the why. A lot of times we go back and dig deep into these stories or even interview people and like they might say one sentence that could be loaded. The why is like loaded so many different reasons. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that part of going back and even bringing up Rodney King and mm -hmm. you know what I mean? All that stuff. So I thought that was pretty cool. 
Andre, do you have a, a different favor? Do you like some of those? Uh, what was the one that uh, Ice Cube narrated? Was it on the Raiders? Uh, Might have been. We did do a Raiders film, and I do remember doing a film with John Singletary, but I can't remember. Singer. Well, I mean, obviously, right out, like... Right? The, did you like the Buster Douglas Mike Tyson one? Oh, yeah. Oh, the like Buster Douglas Mike Tyson one was good. I, I, they're, I they're supposed to work out with Buster Douglas soon. He's right up the street. Word. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, you, I mean, man, obviously, you still got a pretty face for a guy who was who was in there fighting with somebody. <laughs> I don't see any. I don't know how many rounds you went because I don't know. I know. No, no, no. I'm supposed to go. I'm supposed to oh, go. You're supposed but, to go. Yeah. I'm don't get in the ring. Like that, bro. Don't get in the ring. I, I'm not getting it. I'm I'm in chill. I'm in chill. I'm gonna say these hands for like three or four people, and that's it. <laughs> That is a funny line. People. You're going to save yeah. those hands for four or five people? Like, like four or five people. Hey. I already got it on the list. So. That's, that's actually a lovely thing to say, right? <laughs> uh, that's a lovely thing. Well, I mean, before, uh, Evan, we can, uh, Evan, you have the questions, the, uh, yeah, the fire uh, questions? Yeah. Okay, so before, before I go to that, I got one last question I kind of want to ask, and uh, this is more into the lane of, you know, athlete empowerment. Um, and I've had this conversation a lot in the last six, seven years, you know, with all the tech investments that I've been doing, you know, everybody's been, you know, getting into that space and, you know, the vanity and the riding the wave of it. But at the same time, there's still the transaction uh, uh, of a contract that's being had where you can get equity or you can get transaction. And I want to get your take on, you know, when an athlete like LeBron James can leverage his brand and start his own production company, you know, versus someone else who may have a compelling story or may be able to create something compelling that they should sell to an ESPN or to a Hulu or to, a, you know, a big platform, you know, kind of give me your take on, you know, uh, when's the right time to take the transaction and when's the right time to take the equity uh, in the business deal? Um. Look, if you and for the people that, that and for the and for the people that don't know, when I say transaction, I mean the transaction is you know you sign a shoe contract with Adidas and they pay you a million dollars a year and you get incentives if you make the All Star team, you make first team NBA, uh, so on and so forth. Any type of typical endorsement deal where you just get straight paid right. for someone to use your likeness versus the equity side and say no, I'm not going to take a check from you. I'm going to actually take my money and infuse it in your company. And then I'm going to use my brand to leverage the company, but I have ownership in the company. So when Michael Jordan goes to Nike and their market cap is, you know, they're barely a publicly traded company. Now they're, a, I don't even know their market cap. It's in the billions though. Yeah. And Michael Jordan owns 10% of a $500 billion market cap company. You know, and, and instead of getting his uh, royalties every single year, he has those shares that has, a, a, you know, accrued. I got a funny story about uh, Bill Walton. You know, uh, Luke Walton always tells me, you know, you know, Bill Walton was anti-establishment. Uh, you know, he went to UCLA, kind of had the hippie vibes, traveled with the uh, uh, Grateful Dead all those years, but he was anti-establishment. But he got offered actual equity in Nike mm -hmm. early on. And, and, and the late Moses Malone, he was, you know, rest in peace. He was assistant coach for the, for the Sixers when I was there. He had a small, small, small stake in Nike from the beginning. And Luke Walton always says that my dad would have taken that, that contract Nike offered him. He would own 2% of Nike, 1% of Nike still to this day. And he was like, it's crazy. He was anti-establishment. But he mm. also stated if he would have took sign that deal, he said, I wouldn't be here right now. Like, I wouldn't be in the NBA. Like, I would have worked <laughs> or like, I would have chilled. So, you know, just kind of your take on, you know, when is, when is the right time to do the transaction right. side of it or when's the right time to take equity in it? Yeah. I would say it's it's about stature, leverage, and opportunity, right? First of all, if you don't have a certain level of stature, you're talking about Moses Malone, LeBron, they have the ability to, to choose in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And many people won't. But then ultimately, it's about what you believe in, right? Do you believe you need the money now or you're willing to take a risk on something? And what do you think the upside is on a right. transaction versus versus uh equity equity you really got to believe in a company to take equity instead of just taking a check right and it seems all these things seem obvious in retrospect right oh man i should take an equity in nike i don't know yeah. maybe a million dollars was the right thing for somebody to do because you can't tell that nike's gonna was gonna be this kind of success now you're doing some of both right you 
you've got some transactions right. and you yourself are an investor. I should ask you this question. You've done more tra- more equity investments than I have. I've just been a, 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 a paid employee for most of my life. I work hard. I get a check. It was an appropriate check and, and I did well with it. I never chose uh, to take equity instead of uh, compensation. I got some stock in the Walt Disney Company, but but uh, let me make a more a, a different point and, and get both of your reactions to it. Look, I think this athlete empowerment thing, the most important thing it means is it's a, one of the greatest transfers of wealth from white owners to black athletes in the history of the country. And what has happened now is the athletes are taking advantage of this to create multi-generational wealth for their families and change the lives. And this is very different from helping your family while you're making that salary and they're helping you and doing things. This is about what Jay-Z and LeBron talk about, right? I'm gonna use my leverage, my power to make sure that the Jameses, uh, and and the Jay Z's, I don't. Uh, Carter's. 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 The Jay Z. Come up with that right away. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Uh, yeah. That for because because that's what white people in this country have been able to do, right? There's a lot mm-hmm. of Rockefellers who hadn't worked as hard as you have. We still have Rockefeller money, uh, and and other prominent families. This athletes are are appropriately because of the value they provide to the franchise to the owners are appropriately among the highest paid employees in this country but what are you going to do with that money you're asking about one way to create multi-generational wealth andre is it to mm-hmm. equity transaction but what matters is you make the right whatever decision you make there what really matters is are you taking advantage of this transfer of money from traditional power to newly empowered people to create things for your family. It's also why, Evan, I loved your thing about the hands. These hands are for a few people. It's family. It's family. And that's that money. It's the same thing. This money I'm making is for my family, my kids, my grandkids, my partners, my spouses. That's That to me is the most powerful thing here. What do you think about it? Yeah, I, I kind of want to lead this into Evan telling his story of his, he got a transaction in an equity deal uh, coming out of college, but I'll go back and kind of set the landscape of how it worked, where, you know, you we weren't getting paid in college, but you we saw we can leverage our brand as soon as we left. And Evan, winning all three trophies as player of the year uh, in college, which is very rare, only a handful of people have done it historically. Uh, which says a lot about, you know, uh, the value he brought to Ohio State and the program and recruits that would come there and later. But, you know, he did something incredible where uh, Evan kind of tell us the way your shoe deal worked, because a lot of athletes, you know, you can leverage your shoe deal coming straight out of uh, college and the name that you have, you leverage that into the big deals. And it's like, can we still replicate that model anymore uh, if, if the the amateur or the pre-professional athlete landscape is kind of watered down. So we don't identify with some of these names the way we used to. So kind of break down how that, that did work for you, Evan. Yeah. When I came out of college, um, obviously I was, I was like a top five pick and, you know, I met with Nike. I met with, you know, the typical Adidas on the armor, you know, lead knee. Um, just for a few numbers, Nike is offering me, let's just say 400 just right after, you know, this 2010. So like, you know, the shoe money went down a little bit. Adidas offered me, you know, whatever, a million or whatever. But I was fortunate enough to meet, uh, you know, Lee Ning, brand cups from Lee Ning. Mm-hmm. They were coming in. They were trying to build, you know, the basketball brand and everything. And, you know, one thing that my agent at the time, David Falk, was saying, he was like, it's, it's a big thing to be an employee of a company, but it's another thing to, to be, a, you know, a partner of a company. He's like, there's tons of people that aren't, besides the fact that the shoe market is down, he's like, to find some of these deals, you're not going to be able to find it, but you're getting equity in a company across the waters, which is China, you know? And uh, long story short, you know, when he, when he was discussing it to me, it's like, you can go with your favorite shoe company and they might not invest in you the same way or might not allow you to, uh, you, you might have to fight, scratch and claw to get what you deserve in that sense. 
just judging by the way your career is going to go, or you're going to go with Li Ning, who believes in you, who's mm-hmm. offered, offered you the most money by like 10 times. On top of the fact you have equity. It's like when you get older, you're going to be happy you have equity in that company, especially in a big country like China. And, you know, when they're trying to build basketball, I took into consideration that 350 people, million people play basketball each day in China, you know? Mm-hmm. So long story short, I came out of college. I, I signed a Li Ning. Mm-hmm. When I finished my deal or whatever, I signed, I played, I was with them for like 10 years. I checked the stock and everything over that 10 year period. I mean, that bad boy is an eight figure, you know, eight figure number. And that was just off me going, you know, taking equity and believing in the company. And, and right. along with that, I was able to help bring in CJ McCollum. Mm-hmm. I was able to help bring in certain people that are going to uh, boost the company up and, and boost notoriety. And once Dwayne Wade signed, it just took off from there and we all made great money. You know what I mean? And I thought that was uh, something from a sense as a young kid where I wanted to sign with Jordan and my dreams were saying Jordan, Nike, Kobe and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, I took advantage of, you know, who, who saw the value in me as well. And uh, I, I thought that was a big deal. I didn't go. I couldn't think like a kid anymore. I had to think like an adult and a businessman and really what made the most right. sense. So well, I thought that was, a, that was a big you thing. Always go with equity. If, if eight <laughs> figures is involved, go with equity. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm interested in the smaller number, which is three. Well, you said that Evan won all three something. I know one of them is the National College Player of the Year, right? Yeah, I always joke. I always joke about that. Like whenever somebody, you know, the player, all players that play with Evan Turner, they are like my favorite teammate. My like he's revered in Boston. You know how hard it is to be a revered athlete in Boston. <laughs> like that, that me. that's that's not like something right. that you can just say every single day. But right. I also tell people, I'm like, he got all them trophies. He got all the trophies. Like I don't even know all the trophies. What are the trophies, Evans? <laughs> oh shit! The the Naismith, the AP. The wooden. No, I don't remember the other one. But they're then my the mom's house. Yeah, there's yeah. just four of them. There's four of them. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, uh, and they, they ain't all the size of a six year old. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of the size yeah, of I mean, yeah. Look, I, mean, I, 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 yeah, I like a man who's trophy. humble enough he can't remember the big trophies he won. Uh, <laughs> man, it's not even that. It's just the experience. Sometimes when you break it down, I think a lot of people, like you say in general, right. that we all do it for, or, you know, one question we asked you back in the day was, why do you still work? And I, I think the one thing is like the passion behind it. And, you know, we always speak on money and being compensated and stuff, but sometimes it's, it's a little stuff that doesn't, you know, doesn't matter. And it's like the I don't need those trophies because in my head, it already symbolized like doing something people said I couldn't do. Right. You know what I mean? I can throw those bad boys over, but it's like, all right, if you look for the trophies, they're somewhere in my attic or something, but it's like, you know, it, it, it was a commitment to myself where you can overcome. And I think everybody has those, those things. Uh, well, you, you're, you are a humble man because in many places you walk into somebody's house and the first thing you see is a trophy room. And yeah. Back in there in your <laughs> attic tells me something about you and we're back right to where we at the start about why you want to be in business and, and why I want to work. This is fun. You meet new people, you have new experiences, you, you run into people who share values. I, I admire that very much. I mean, that's a, a, a you know, another uh, lovely thing. Gotcha. All right. Well, we can. Um, I was also going to have fun with that, by the way, because I was wondering if Tyler Hansborough won all the same trophies. I think he did. Yeah, he did. I, I think, I think Tyler did. Might, uh, Tyler was a beast. I'm not knocking. Tyler was unbelievable. I was no, no, I'm we, kidding you. Yeah, no, I was just saying, like, when you break it down, you ask me about Tyler Hansborough. It's like, all right, the sky is blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, and by the way, we, you, you, you were not disrespectful to Tyler Hansborough. We were I'm not, having some I'm fun, and I'm a Tar Heel. And I'm just having some fun back with you. Just try, I'm going to check on all those trophies. I think he won them all, too. I think yeah, he did, too. Think he Who knows? Yeah. It but, is. Those, but I mean, the, it's something for us to talk about some other time that'll be fun, which is the difference between, and it gets back to what we are talking about before, there are guys who are great college players whose game is not built for the NBA. No, true story. Absolutely. And when you read, I always joke around and say, like, there's, to be like an NBA player and be at that high level, it, obviously you have to be mentally good and skill wise, but like, I'm not saying touch, but like, look at Iggy's body. Like, you know what I mean? At age 37 or 38, like, once you make it past your prime, there's something different that, that guys are using or guys have, or, you know, the mentality of it. Um, 
where they're able to push these careers to 15, 16, 17 and keep that type of focus. I mean, it's unbelievable. I think there's a big difference of a college guy and, you know, and, and a guy like Iguodala who was all NBA, you know, all world Olympic gold medalist, probably one of the best athletes in our, you know, during our time in our sport. So it's, it's, it's levels for sure. I just saw the kid from the uh, Villanova who made the game winning shot when he beat Carolina in the championship. Yeah, and so I was like, wait, who was that guy? Right, exactly. Like, Chris I think he Jenkins. knew his career was over just after yeah. he made the shot. Like, I don't think he pursued to play basketball after college. I mean, he just leveraged it like he's supposed to into a job with, you know, Villanova. Like, he's revered at Villanova. Like, you were just speaking, Skip. Yep. Like, the Villanovas, the Gonzagas, like, you know, right. there's a place for those guys, and, 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 and they'll always have that support, and you'll always get those eyeballs. So it's just interesting. Yeah. Oh, man, you're giving me a bad memory. Uh, I was at that Final Four. And and remember the kid, I forget Marcus the, Page hit that Marcus bullshit Page. shot that it, double shot. Way, he had a double clutch. Remember, yeah. he went up and his yeah. shot was gonna get blocked, but he could stay in the air longer than the defender. So he double clutched and shot with his left mm, hand, I did a three-pointer. I thought we had won. And then I could still see those Villanova guys coming up the left side of the court, setting a pick, and the guy hitting a crazy shot. That was crazy. Yeah. He just he could shoot that bad boy too. Yes, that's for sure. Yeah. So, so uh, anyway, that's good fun. Marcus Page, good player. Another player who in some ways wasn't yeah. built for the NBA, yeah. but was a yeah. spectacular college player. Yeah, Iowa kid. He's from Iowa. He's really good. I think yeah. that was his first shot he made all year that year, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, he I, was a great, but he was a great. I like Barry. Star. He was a, he was yeah. an old fashioned yeah. distributor, played defense. You know, ran the fast break. He was a great yeah. college player. Uh, he did struggle with. He was not a pure shooter. Yeah, but but to his defense, I think when he came alive was when you guys were kind of a couple players transferred out his rookie his freshman year. Yeah, and I feel like he saved the momentum of North Carolina basketball just with his score in the first year and a half or so until people found out about him. Yeah, and then obviously, clearly, he, he ended up his, his career great. But I, yeah. he's still unreal. He's a killer for sure. Yeah. That's well, that's fun. Skip, yes, sir. Well, Skip, I, I appreciate the time. Uh, we gonna this is the first of many conversations we plan on having with you as business partners. You know, uh, mm -hmm. we want to continue that. We, we, we can have a year recaps and, and your favorite uh snippets uh from the from the from the pod and uh, you know, giving people a heads up on what we got coming. Uh, in the future from metal art, you know, not just from the podcast, but we got some, some great things uh, that, that, that we're building and, and that we're conceptualizing in our brains. So just thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate you believing in us and what we're trying to do. Uh, folks, uh, this guy's loves hanging behind uh, in the background, which is the type of guy I like, but uh, he's, he's making some powerful moves and uh, we're excited to be in, in business with him.